Hello, Smack. I'm Ben Smith from Ultrasound of the Week. Ultrasound of the Week? Really? Yeah. The Week? Oh, I could click forward. There we go. So I went to your website recently and uh, Ultrasound of the Week. I looked at your most latest po po uh, post two months ago. You should consider calling it Ultrasound of the, I don't know, every couple of months or so. OK. All right. Fair enough. Uh, and I'm Jacob Avila of Five Minute Sono. Five minutes, huh? So I've prepared a little histogram uh, here. And if you look, you only really hit the five minute mark less than half the time. So let's call it like three to eight minutes sauna. What do you think about that? Yeah, all right. I'll all buy right. the URL. That's a good all point. Right. I appreciate the feedback. Do you mind if I go through a case with you? Please. All right. So it's July. You got your new interns in. And it, you have somebody come in. Bad trauma. Head injury. Obvious laceration. Swinging at staff, right? Somebody who you're going to have to protect his airway. I know this guy. Now, he also has a C collar on. Okay. He's a little fluffy. He has no jaw. He's going to be a difficult airway, right? Mm -hmm. You know that you're going to need to use some advanced laryngoscopy. Yep. So use your VO, your video laryngoscopy. But it's broken. Or it's unavailable, or somebody else is using it. It doesn't matter. You can't have it. I mean, VO would be my first choice, for sure, for this patient. Uh, you know, but can we just use our physical exam to confirm intertracheal tube placement? What do you think about that? We, we could use our physical exam, but yeah. actually the literature behind that's pretty poor. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, how about then end tidal CO2? Everybody has end tidal CO2, right? That's the standard of care. Okay, yeah, sure. So let's go down that route. Yeah. You have your intern, brand new intern, uh -huh. go ahead and intubates your patient. It says he sees the cord, see that tube, go right through the cord. Smooth. Smooth. And you put the colorimetric CO2 detector on that tube. You bag once, you get a little bit of color change. You think, well, I'm going to bag a second time, see what I see more. The color change goes away. And immediately, hot dog chunks uh. everywhere. There's vomit, so now you have a difficult area that became a little more difficult. Yeah. yeah what no, if I told you there was another tool you could add to your armamentarium to help you be a better clinician and do better by your patient? So are you telling me that I need to add another step to this patient's critical airway, a very time-sensitive airway? Yeah, I mean, it is something else. It's another tool in your armamentarium, but I mean, to be a good clinician, you want all the tools at your disposal. And you know, bringing the old shot machine to the room doesn't really take that much time. All right, you're right. Okay, um, how can we do it? How do you do it? So the literature behind this is actually pretty profound. I mean, we had a bunch of stuff in the 80s, and then we had a little bit of a lull and a lot more stuff more recently. And in fact, there's even been enough for a few meta-analyses that have shown pretty good results. Well, you know what they say about meta-analysis. Crap in equals crap out, right? Come on. Yeah, they do say that, but these studies are actually really good, and they show that the sensitivity and specificity is actually in the upper 90s. Additionally, the most recent ACLS guidelines actually suggest using your ET, the ultrasound, to help confirm your ET tube placement. That's right. Uh, I believe this is actually the only place that ultrasound was mentioned in these newest guidelines, which is somewhat surprising. I mean, come on, pseudo PEA on ultrasound? Give me yeah. a break. Yeah, maybe in the next ones. So let's talk about how to actually do this now. The equipment you're going to want, you're going to want a rag in one hand and uh, whatever transducer you want in the other hand. Now, the rag is because you have to use that gel, right, yep. to put on the neck. And you might be in a situation where you have to manipulate the airway. Uh, you have to maybe do a crike. So you want to make sure to be able to take that gel out of the way quickly. Now, as far as the transducer, you can use the linear or the curvilinear transducer. A lot of places use the linear. Personally, I like the curve linear better because it, it gives like me a the, bit of a wider footprint. It seems like the, the linear transducer would be a little better since it's higher frequency, like a higher resolution, right? Yeah, um, you could definitely do that. And a lot of people like that. And occasionally I use that. But personally, curve linear, you know what? There's not a big difference between the two. You can use one, use the other. Phase array is probably one that you shouldn't use. Now, as far as actually placing it on the neck, you're going to want to place it in the either super short notch or a little bit lateral. Most places that I've read actually place it in the suprasternal notch, but I actually like to see the esophagus at the same time that I've seen the trachea. A lot of times that esophagus is going to be behind the trachea. The air in the trachea is going to block the sound waves from getting to the esophagus. That's right. Airway, uh, air actually blocks sound waves, on ultrasound at least. That's a good point. Thank you yeah. for teaching me that. Yeah. So you want to place it on the side because that way you can see the esophagus and see the trachea at the same time, and I like 
complete control when I'm doing these kind of things. Okay. So what does it actually look like on the actual ultrasound? Okay. So uh, here's the ultrasound image right here. This is the curvilinear. Notice that footprint. Yep. Over here we have the trachea and we have the esophagus right next to it. And if you notice, I'm applying a little bit of pressure to that trachea. That makes that esophagus kind of pop out a little bit out from underneath it. That's usually what I do because I like seeing both things at the same time. I like seeing the trachea and I like seeing the esophagus. When you look with a linear transducer, your vascular probe, it looks pretty similar. Maybe a little bit of a clearer image. You don't always get this nice of an image, though. Um, so whichever one you want to use, the images are going to look the same. You have an air-filled trachea with some shadowing behind it, and then an esophagus on one side or the other. All right, the anatomy pictures are great. But what does it look like when you're actually performing the scan? All right. So you want to uh, have your normal kind of positioning. You've got your intubator at the head of the bed. You're going to be at the side, remember, with that probe a little lateral. Uh -huh. And go ahead and you're going to do your intubation, right? Now, this is what it looks like when uh, you make a boo-boo, right? Now, let me ask you a question, Ben. Is it better to have two tracheas or one trachea? My first instinct is that two tracheas are better than one. Okay. But the way you asked the question made it seem like a trick question, so I'm going to say one's better, actually. Yeah. That is correct. Okay. So you actually want there to be, in fact, one trachea uh, in the neck. If you see two tracheas, so you see two kind of round structures with air in it, with shadow behind it, that is bad. If you have two tracheas, that means you have tubed the goose okay. or tubed the esophagus. All right. Now let's pull it back out and let's see what it looks like when you intubate the trachea like you're supposed to. Now pay attention to it and see how you get a little bit of movement in it. I see it. A little reverberation artifacts, some common tails within it. That's how you know that you're endotracheal inside I, the trachea. I got it. It's, it's subtle, but I can see it. So what's it going to look like, say, from the resident who's intubating's perspective? What's it going to look like? All right. Pretty similar to what you might suspect. So here we're going in and we see nice cords, right? And there's the ultrasound image, and you can see here that uh, we got a little, maybe too enthusiastic, maybe a little uh, over our steps here. And we have now two tracheas. Now, two tracheas, good or bad? Two tracheas, bad. There we go. Two tracheas, bad. So we're going to pull it out and put it into the trachea. Notice the little cometal artifacts, reverberation artifacts within the trachea. This is good. This is an endotracheal intubation. I see. Now, I like that you can see that you've put it in the trachea, the correct placement, but Let's say I want to know where in the trachea I put it. Is there any way to do that? So you're basically asking, can we confirm it as being endobronchial versus endotracheal? Good correct two positioning. I'm glad you asked. So what you can do is you can place the probe in the suprasternal notch in a transverse orientation. And that's actually where your bulb should be, your cuff, your ET tube cuff. Yeah. And I want you to pay attention to the width of the trachea here and watch what happens when I insufflate the cuff. It gets a little wider, oh, right? I so that, that is an air-filled cuff being insufflated. If you see this in the suprasternal notch, you are good. You are in the correct position. That bulb, that cuff, excuse me, is right underneath the cords where you should be. I see it. Now, air, right? Block sound was like you just taught me. Right. What you can do is you can actually use saline instead of air, and you can actually see the cuff a lot more clearly. So check this out. You see it? Getting a little bit bigger. Yeah, you can kind of see some air percolating through the fluid. That's yeah. 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 Well, what if you have the probe right at the suprasternal notch, you insufflate it with either air or saline, and you see nothing, like nothing happens? So you're asking me, if I place the probe in the transverse orientation and I don't see the bulb, how do I know if my bulb, my cuff, is too high or too low? Right. That's a great question. I've wondered this myself, and so what I've actually been doing recently is I've been placing the probe in a sagittal orientation, so probe marker facing up towards the patient's head with the other part of the transducer, not the probe marker side, at the suprasternal notch. And that way, I can actually see the whole trachea from a little above the cords to where that suprasternal notch is. And I feel like I'm much better at identifying exactly where that cuff is. So you look at this image on the left side of the screen. That's your probe marker. So that's up. So the right side is actually down. And you see that air artifact from the trachea. And you can see if you see that bulb insufflate right here, that cuff. I like it. Then you're in the good spot. If this is in the suprasternal notch, you're in a good location. And there's no problem with putting saline in there, right? I mean, it seems like it'd be increased pressure on the trachea versus just air. Any problems with that? Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the ENT surgeons, they typically i have seen them do this a lot, and I haven't heard of anything bad happening to them. But I, I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate that. This is something that might be new, and uh, sometimes you don't you get worried about causing harm, right? Right. So what I do, you fill it with saline to confirm it, lock your tube, put it in place, take the saline out, and then reinflate it with air, okay. and you're all good.
All right, so what you're telling me is that you can actually use ultrasound to confirm intertracheal tube placement in the trachea um, and actually where it is in the trachea without right. having to worry about potentially insufflating the stomach and causing aspiration, vomit, horrible airway. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Now, if you guys have any questions or comments about this topic or anything else ultrasound, feel free to send us a tweet on the Twitter. Um, here are our hashtags here, or our, I guess our usernames here. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, guys.